Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, where we put our faith in Jesus, who was raised from the dead, and whose body is the church. So therefore, we this morning, we proclaim our repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus, our Savior, as we worship in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, the only announcement I think I have this morning is that a reminder next week is Pentecost So if you wanted to wear your red next week, you certainly can uh, Are there any other announcements? Oh, there's one other one um, So for annual conference, there's uh, usually they take up a collection within the churches for Midwest distribution and so there's a flyer um, on the table as you come in if you wanted to gather some things and donate those um, and then we'll make sure they get up to where they need to go um, at one of the conference sites. Um, there's also asking, they can said you can give a financial donation if you'd rather do that instead. So if you do that, you can just put that um, you know, right in care of the church and, and just write on there that it's for the uh, annual conference donation and, and we'll get that taken care of too. Are there any other announcements this morning? Yes, ma'am. Today is Gracie's birthday and Kyle's graduation. Oh, that's a great day for them, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Well, we'll, we'll help them to celebrate, I hope, today, okay? All right, good. Yeah, and we are recognizing our graduates next week, so we've, we've uh, notified them that, that we are uh, going to recognize them, so... Next week will be a graduation <coughs> recognition for all those who have graduated. And food, food pantry is this Thursday? Okay. So just a reminder of the food pantry this Thursday and, and uh, all are welcome to come and, and partake. All right. And with, I think that was it. So let's join in our opening hymn this morning. It's number 154 of the United Methodist Hymnal. All hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs>
your hands, people of God. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord our God, the Most High, is awesome. God is a great king over all the earth. Sing praises to God. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a song and with joy in our hearts. God is king over all the nations. Sing praises to God, for God is highly exalted. Please join me in our statement of faith, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. us and our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> Blessed are you, Holy One, creator of all that is and all that ever will be. You sent your holy child, Jesus, to heal us and bless us, to show us your love. After his suffering and death on the cross, he was still among us, proclaiming repentance and forgiveness of sins for all who call on his name. Just as you sent the power of the Holy Spirit to those who first believed, fill us now with your power and grace that we may become the hands and feet and heart and spirit of Christ. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Our gospel re reading today is from Luke chapter 24 verses 44 through 53. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. Our response to God's word is hymn number 328 in the United Methodist hymnal, Surely the Presence of the Lord.
you be in an attitude of prayer with me this morning? Gracious Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day of sunshine. And Lord, thank you for warming our hearts with it. We ask now that you continue to bless our worship service this morning and open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear the words that you have for us this morning. And Lord, for myself, I ask that you empty me out of myself and fill me up with your Holy Spirit so the words of the, my mouth and the meditation of my heart are known to be your words and not mine. Amen. I have a short reading that kind of goes along with our um, gospel lesson today that I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 1, starting at uh, verse 17. I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is hope to, into which he was called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This again is the word of our Lord for us today. I'm going to ask you this morning, have you ever attempted to do something that might have seemed like kind of a daunting task to you? Something you might have thought was Oh, it's going to take me forever to get this done, and I'm not even sure that I have the skills to do it kind of thing. You know, maybe it was something new, like, oh, let's say the first time you tried to make something in the kitchen that was uh, to be, you know, really present, a big presentation thing, and, and uh, maybe you're decorating a cake or, or making something kind of pretty to give away, and, and well, you kind of realize I'm not a cake decorator, I'm not a cake artist, I'm not like one of those people that are on the Food Network show that can do all these wonderful things and, and make it look all glorious, or, um, or maybe it was one of those things you were, uh, had some chores to do around the house, maybe like tackle a plumbing problem or a small electrical issue. Maybe you were wary about doing those because, well, gosh, what if I mess it up? I might flood part of the house or, or I might not be able to use, you know, the, the sink or the toilet or whatever it is you're repairing for a period of time. Or maybe you were worried about when you got done wiring something that when somebody goes to flip a light switch, they might shock themselves or, or, or something worse. Maybe on those things, you might have even had someone who encouraged you or, or a mentor who was telling you that, you know, you can do it. You can do these things. They're, they're not that difficult. You have to study and put your mind to it. But you can do these things. And even though you might have had someone that encouraged you, maybe you still had some self-doubts with yourself and, and you were kind of eating yourself up inside. Because you see, we all want to succeed in whatever it is that we do. It's the way we're kind of wired as human beings, isn't it? We want to be good at what, whatever we're trying to tackle. We want to succeed in, in whatever we're doing. We want to have those good results from our labors. Uh, in John Maxwell's book called Be All You Can Be, he had a story about a university psychologist who was performing some experiments to go into his thesis paper. And it was about productive results. And in this experiment, um, the psychologist went out and he, and he saw a group of loggers, because he was from the uh, Pacific Northwest, and saw some some guys that were logging and he offered a couple of them a, a unique position. He said, you know what? You don't, you can come work for me for a day. I will pay you double your normal daily salary. And guess what? You don't have to, to cut any wood trees down. You don't have to go out in the forest. I'll have a log right there in, this, in a room for you. And all you have to do is chop on it with the blunt side of the ax. In other words, the wrong side, not the cutting blade, but that flat side that's, you know, the blunt side. And all you have to do is just kind of whack at it and, you know, and, and, 
and that's all you have to do all day long, okay? Instead of going out here and chopping the wood and look out for the trees and all the stuff that's going to fall on you and getting all dirty and doesn't that sound great? And he had somebody that actually took him up on it. And so he went and, and uh, you know, like, like you said, the professor wasn't exactly, wasn't expecting that logger to cut the wood or anything and, or chop anything up, have a big pile of stuff when he's done, just, just smack on that log with the wrong side. And so after that day of, uh, of he was, came in early and, and was ready to start work, I'm, I'm smacking that log with the blunt end. And so he did that for about half a day. And then he quit. He just said, I've had enough. I'm not doing this anymore. And so the psychologist asked him, why did you give up? Why, you know, this is an easy job, or th so you thought. And the Lord looked at him and said, I have to see the chips fly in order for me to think I'm accomplishing something. If I don't see the chips fly, it's not any fun. Isn't that true for us sometimes? If we don't see the fruits of our labor or what we're doing, it's not any fun for us. You know, Maxwell went on to comment in this book that he was convinced that there are many Christians that are using the wrong side of their axes and there were no chips flying because they aren't seeing the fruits of their labor. They're not seeing the results that they thought they had. And so what should be joy in their hearts and, and like that logger, oh, I get excited at it and I find it fulfillment by seeing the wood chips fly. Sometimes Christians get a little discouraged and when they don't see the results of, of Christians coming or people coming into church or, or people that they have converted or saved for Christ. Because after all, don't we want to all succeed? We want to see those chips fly and see the fruit that we have produced. So maybe the question for us to look at this morning then is, how do we live a successful life and let those chips fly? You know, if you look at our gospel lesson, the, the disciples, like most of their countrymen, most of those Israelites, had grown up with great expectations of the coming Messiah. And then as adults, they had staked all their hopes in this great prophet named Jesus, this really young prophet that was all just rocking their world and changing things upside down. You know, and in the beginning, when they were with him, oh, everything just seemed perfect and right. They were, things were going great. They saw miracles and heard of all his teachings. And they saw lives transformed by Jesus. And then in the last couple of weeks, they saw that everything seemed to go wrong. They seemed to have come to grips that Jesus wasn't that great hero of a war conqueror that had come to conquer the Romans, and, but instead he was conquering people's hearts and changing their lives. And they got that because the crucifixion definitely did not fit into the plans of someone who thought the Messiah was a great warlord or a, a great soldier and, and would come and free them from the rules and the impressions of those that they were living under. And in fact, if you remember right after the crucifixion, the disciples were devastated and they kind of scattered away, you know. Some of the fishermen, they went back to fishing and, ah, oh, it just, well, this is all done and over with. We don't see any of the fruits of the labors anymore. The ending was not what they thought it should be. But then they saw Jesus alive again. Jesus showed themselves to them and he was alive. And, and he would say, touch me, talk to me, eat with me. And then they were wondering why, why had it all turned out this way? And then Jesus, if you remember what Susan read earlier, said, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Must be fulfilled. 
Now, that seems like a pretty big imperative word, doesn't it? Must? I mean, that's a, a certainty word. Was there something else that they, had, that they had to look forward to? Maybe some events unfolded as they had because they had been written about many, many, many years ago. You know, they had been forewritten because there is a God who calls things that are not as though they were, it says in Romans chapter 4. And if we look back even to the Old Testament, Daniel, the prophet Daniel said, heaven rules. Wow, that's pretty simple. Two words, heaven rules. God wins, right? That's what that's saying. You see, God planted his plan long ago, or at least stated that, uh, or as it was stated in the New Testament time, time and time again, before the world began. God had his plan set long ago before the world began. And so God's plan is unfolding on the table of human events. God will not be thwarted. He, his plans won't change. History will arrive at God's milestones. Why? Because Christ is the fulfillment of this prophecy. You see, Jesus speaks of the Hebrew scriptures as threefold canons, right? He talks about the law. He talks about the prophets. And he talks about the Psalms, all kind of together and, and as the great writings and teachings. And so if we look back, we look in Deuteronomy, the law, where we hear about the Messiah, who is the one who is to come and to save them. Do you remember John the Baptist was asked many times, are you the prophet that must come before the Messiah? So people were knowing and remembering of these Old Testament prophecies. And then you also remember that Jesus was questioned time and time again. Are you the one who was promised long ago? In the prophets, there was the, the text from which Philip began to preach about Jesus to that eunuch on that, on that road, that, that, that person from Ethiopia. And when he preached to him in the chariot, and, the, and at the end, you know, he took him and wanted, that, that person wanted to be baptized by Philip. And then from the Psalms, the Apostle Paul was bold to declare what God promised our fathers has been fulfilled. By raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. You see, Jesus was revealing these prophecies to the disciples. In other words, he opened their minds to the understand the scriptures as, it, as, it worded, as it's worded today in our gospel reading. Now, there's kind of two different ways that this opening has been understood over the years. One is that Jesus directly by a divine intervention kind of removed, as it were, those scales from their eyes so, and, and, and unplucked their ears so that they could see and hear clearly. Or at least that's the way Acts chapter 9 describes it. Or maybe he removed the veils from their hearts, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when it talks about how Christ was affecting the disciples in this week that was before, or this time before Pentecost. And then the other opening that was affected or talked about in the explanations were those, those uh, explanations from Jesus that he went on to give later on. You know, perhaps it was their expectations or maybe what they understood about the Messiah that they had hoped the Messiah or who they hoped that Messiah would be that that kind of had befuddled and put those scales or that veil on their hearts of their disciples. You know, maybe they thought the law and the prophets and the Psalms were talking of an imperial Messiah, someone who's a great leader and a great king coming to conquer. And all that time, they didn't realize they were in the midst of that suffering savior, suffering servant that was a savior. And that never registered with, with them of that Messiah that was prophesied long ago because they had this, this image inside of us. And sometimes don't we let our images inside of us kind of stop us and block us and, and keep us from doing things? 
maybe tackling, decorating that beautiful cake or, or, or a plumbing job or electrical job or whatever that thing is in our life. You see, the, the disciples were seeing Christ as they wanted him to be rather than who he was. And that's been a problem for Christians ever since that first century disciples, hasn't it? Perhaps we just need to pray like that, that old hymn goes, Open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus. You see, Jesus is the prophet of this fulfillment as it was, as it was prophesied. Say that past three times. <laughs> he explained it clearly and opened their eyes when he said, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Oh, that's where they were gathering for Pentecost, wasn't it? And then Jesus went on to remind them, you are witnesses of these things. Wow. The disciples were witnesses and were able to tell the story of Jesus and how that came together, who Jesus really was, as it was foretold in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. You see, Jesus could accurately call, be called the future because he is the prophet that they were waiting for. As he sits on the throne of his ascension, heaven still rules. He may reign in the hearts of each of us as well forever. And that's my prayer. So maybe the question is, what do we do with this knowledge that we have that, that yes, Jesus wasn't who we expected him to be. And maybe we need to rethink some of our own expectations as well. First of all, we have to think and remember that we live a life of faith. Successful living must start and end with living in faith with an all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing and all-wise God. It's not us. It's not about us. It's not about what we kind of project onto who God is or who Jesus was, but it truly is accepting who he is and, and looking beneath those words that were written to really identify who Jesus is. See, when we grasp for God to, for a God to serve, we, we don't have to waver in our living. God doesn't move at all. God is constant. He's the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. It's us that do the moving. It's us are, that are the ones that are being transformed by God. The ones that change their image of who we thought Jesus and God is. It's one of the keys of spiritual success is keeping close to that spiritual heater, so to speak, Jesus. Our faith in him must not be moved. A spiritual successful life results from comprehending and applying all of our things we've learned about life, about God's grace for us, and through this awesome power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to experience all dimensions of God. When we experience God in his fullness, and not just one little piece at a time from as we pick and choose and what we want to think God is and want to believe who God is, but we want to see God all together. You know, that picking and choosing, that could be convenient for us, having that preconceived idea of, of who God is and what his kingdom is really about. Because we have to understand those pieces and then put them all together for us to really be sustained during all phases of life circumstances, both the good and the bad. So in other words, for us to be successful, we need to see the wood chips fly as we chop that wood or, or as we bear the fruit of Jesus, in other words. It means to have a deep and strong experience with the living God as he reveals himself to us through every day through his Holy Spirit in everyday means and, and ways that sometimes if we don't keep our eyes open, we just might miss God's presence that day. 
as we are allow the Holy Spirit to take control and further shape us into who we are meant to be in Jesus, the things of God become more evident and more clear in our daily lives. And lastly, we live to we learn to live in a hope of real inheritance with Jesus. So what does that really mean to live in a hope of that inheritance? Uh, here's an illustration. A small town was destined to become a large lake. And so we had the, the town had been told about this and, and the, from the uh, Corps of Engineers and the properties that had all been purchased for the project. And the people were told they could remain in their homes and, until the dam was constructed and, and erected and ready to go and they were ready to flood the area. And at that time, everybody had to be out and, and say their last goodbyes to their homes and, and so forth. And, but it would take the Corps of Engineers several years to build this big dam and make all the final preparations. And so a man who was being interviewed a, couple, a year or so later said that the most painful part of that experience outside of the realization that he'd have to move from this town where he'd lived all his life was watching his hometown die See, all the improvements and repairs stopped around town. Nobody was fixing up their house. Nobody was painting or, or reshingling or anything else because after all, that whole town was going to get flooded. So none of the potholes were getting fixed. Everything was going to disrepair because why? Why worry about building and repairing? We're just going to get covered with water. Why pick up the garbage? Why paint over the graffiti or or anything else and he said that those years before the flooding that the whole town was in a state of depression and he made this insightful comment when there is no hope in the future there is no power in the present wow when there's no hope in the future there's no power in the present you see, the people of that town lost all their hope, kind of like the disciples lost their hope right after Jesus was crucified. Because they thought, both in both instances, they thought they knew what the end would be. The disciples were thinking of this great Messiah, and then oh, it didn't turn out that way. He wasn't the conqueror, and the Romans actually put him to death. It's all said and over with now, isn't it, they thought. And those town people... They were told their land had been purchased and, and, and were told that they'd have to move and, and waiting for that construction project to, to start. And they waited and waited and waited while they let their town go to disrepair. And finally, the Corps of Engineers came back and said, oh, well, we're not going to build a dam or a lake here after all. All that wasted time of being depressed and not taking care of of the things that God had given them in their town. They lost their hope. And as that, that project was canceled, that town was not flooded, it was like that the disciples being surprised in the end. And so was that town. The disciples were surprised to see Jesus alive and, and be with them. And, and finally had those scales removed from their eyes and got that aha moment. And sort of that town, oh, we can stay living here. I guess I better start fixing stuff up again. We have to remind ourselves sometimes that we still have to try. We can't get discouraged because we don't see people coming into the church all the time and filling our pews up. But we still have to try and win one person after another for Jesus. We have to remind ourselves that our hope is in the resurrection and in the inheritance. But in the meantime, we need to have our feet firmly planted in the ground and work for the transformation of God's kingdom here on this earth until we wait for that final day of victory. We need to focus on the present and do what we're called by God to do right here and right now. We must not be so heavenly minded and think of all that glory that's going to come to me someday when we're in the midst of the here and the now and we get no value out of that at this moment. We've got to let the chips fly and live life to its fullest now. 
So my question and challenge for you this week is, do we think that we know the end of the story? Do we think that Jesus is kind of finished with us on here on earth? Oh, Jesus came, he conquered, and, not, and now we're just waiting patiently, twiddling our thumbs as we, as we wait for, for Jesus to come again. Or do we go out and proclaim the gospel to everyone we see and meet and know? In other words, do we think Jesus is finished with us? Or are we still living in hope that we can transform, transform the world around us? Amen. Would you be in a word of prayer with me? Lord Jesus, we just ask that you help us to understand and take the scales from our eyes. Open our eyes so we can see you clearly. And Lord, help us that even though we don't always see the fruits of our labor, those wood chips fall fly around us when, when we're trying to extol your virtues and teach others about you. Lord, we never might see the end of that, but Lord, we always know that you are present and all we have to do, our part of the job, to tell them about you, to show how you have transformed our lives so that perhaps you can work on their hearts and transform their lives in the end as well. And so we ask you to let us give us that patience and that current encouragement day in and day out as we go out and transform lives for you. Amen. Let's join in our hymn of response this morning to the United Methodist Hymnal number 312, Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise.
What joys and concerns uh, do we have to lift up today besides Gracie's birthday and Kyle's graduation? And for all those that are graduating uh, this today uh, from Ridgeview and, and other high schools around the area. So we just lift them up and, and uh, ask for God's protection amongst them. Let's join in our prayer chorus this morning. Oh, I um, also want to keep uh, Margaret in our prayers. Um, she's hurt her back, um, and she's uh, getting some treatments from her doctor, so that's why we haven't seen Frank and Margaret. Uh, we've talked to them this week, and they're, they're doing fine, but uh, just uh, continue prayers for uh, relief of pain and, and some healing in her back. Um, let's join together then in our prayer chorus um, as we... Uh, center our thoughts this morning. you have done for us and for you giving us your son Jesus and Lord we just ask your blessing upon us this day as as we pray for those both in our hearts and those we have lifted out loud Lord we celebrate with Gracie uh, for her birthday today and, and Lord just keep her safe and uh, let her enjoy her day to uh, the best of her abilities today Lord and Lord just continue to bless her in her life. And Father, as Kyle graduates and, and celebrates his graduation today, we, along with all the other uh, Ridgeview graduates, we just ask your blessing upon them this day. Father, just fill them uh, with the feeling of hope and set them a direction to go on. And Lord, just be with them as they change this phase of their life and go into the next. And Father, we also come before you with Margaret, who's uh, got some pain in her back and, and undergoing some treatments. And Lord, we just uh, ask your blessing upon her to ease that pain, to help the doctors and medical staff to, to figure out how best to treat her. And uh, Lord, just to, to keep her strong and, and uh, uh, let her rest, because we all know she likes to be active. And Lord, just get her, let her get the rest she needs to, to heal and, and get back to doing the things she likes to do. And Lord, also be with Frank um, as they uh, uh, need each other to, to help uh, with one another in this time. Father, we ask all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Today, we're, we come to the time where we lift up our tithes and offerings to God, and we're filled with the hope that to which Christ has called us. So let us joyfully give our gifts to God through our tithes, our offerings, and our gifts of ourselves in service to him as an act of, uh, act of worship and love to God. Amen. Let's join in our doxology this morning, praising him for all that he has given us. <laughs> Thank you. 
both comfort and challenge. We have been blessed to know the feeling of being surrounded in your loving arms like a child and a parent. Yet we also know that is not a place that we can always stay. You send us to be part of this world, but not of the world. You call us to give so that love, compassion, and hope might be set loose. We are not giving as those who are of the world. In other words, we're not expecting to receive anything in, in return for this. But instead, we give away out of our gratitude for your loving heart made known to us in Jesus Christ. Use us in this way, we pray, in the blessed name of Christ our Savior, who by your love overcame death. Amen. Let's join this morning in our closing hymn. It's from The Faith We Sing. It's number 2171, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
So as we let the light of Jesus shine on us, let's get our hands up and receive his blessing for us today. Go into the world, clothed with the power on, from on high, carrying Christ's message of forgiveness and joy to others. May the power of the Holy Spirit go with you as you bear witness to this good news. Amen. Thank you.